this is an incredible story. Jan, good morning. How are you? Hey, I'm great. Thank you. And you Thank are, you. so you're Jan Broberg in the documentary, but I believe you're married now and go by a different last name and you've uh you've you've moved on the best you possibly can after something like this correct i have but i still have my my name is still jam broberg <laughs> um, I've, I've held on to that all right so for anyone who hasn't seen this documentary i don't want to ruin it for anyone um i go watch this because it's an incredible story i'd never heard this story before uh, but this happened back in the in the 70s, and you were a young girl, um, and your family met a guy. Um, mm -hmm. well, how old was he at the time, like 45 or something, roughly? He was uh, in late 30s, okay. almost 40. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, so you met him. You were about 10 years old when you met this guy, and he was just a nice person. Nice guy that was a friend of your parents, and he showed an interest in, in kids, and in you in particular. Um, and you got to be close with this guy over a period of about two years, right? Two and a half years. This, this man, his wife, and five children moved into our neighborhood. Yeah. And you become friends with the kids. You're all hanging out. It's, it's uh, basically a scene that you would, like a Norman Rockwell painting or something, just all American totally. kind of uh, happy families. Yep. Eat dinner together, go on little trips together. Um, he had, they had a boat, they had a trampoline, they had snowmobiles, had all the stuff we didn't have. <laughs> all the fun <laughs> stuff, all the fun stuff the kids love. Um, exactly. And then again, to paint in broad strokes, cause I, I don't want to, uh, I want people to go watch this documentary. Um, he ends up uh, saying, I'm going to take Jan out to, to ride horses. And uh, this seems like a normal kind of thing, I suppose, because you're close with this, this family and this guy. And uh, we'd done it. We'd gone before. I'd, I'd gone horseback riding with his older son uh -huh. and myself. And that was the plan that his son was going to maybe come out a little later with my dad. And there was no suspicion whatsoever on your part. You're at this point, 12 years old. There's no suspicion at all that anything nefarious is going on uh, by this guy, correct? Oh, none, nothing. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Absolutely. he was like my dad. He was just like a second father and they had become best friends. And, and yeah, there was no suspicion anywhere at all. So you go, uh, you after school or whatever, you go and you go horseback riding or you think you're going to go horseback riding and he gives you this pill. He says, hey, look, uh, you're going to be around horses. Your allergies are going to flare up. Take this pill. We don't want you to have a runny nose, uh, itchy eyes, whatever. You take this pill. Before you know it, you wake up and you're strapped basically uh, by, by held down by the ankles and the wrists. You're in a uh, like a camper. Uh, his camper, and you're you're driving down a highway. You don't know where you are. You just you know you're in trouble. Yeah, and I don't know who's driving. I can't see. Uh, I'm yeah. My wrists and my ankles are strapped to the bed in the back of a motorhome that's moving down a down a kind of desert highway. I could lift my head up high enough to see out of the little curtains, but it's pretty dark, and I could tell it was desert. I was in and out of sleep. That's right. Had you ever been in his motorhome before, or was that the first time? No, I had no idea where I was. Okay, he didn't. He didn't own a motorhome <laughs> that we that we knew of. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, what was the first thing that went through your mind when you wake up and you're strapped down like that? Well, because of the extensive brainwashing that that happened when I woke up, there was a high pitched monotone voice playing in my ear. And because it was in the 70s and he had taken all of us kids to a number of different films that were popular that had to do with like E.T. and extraterrestrials and, and films like that were, were pretty popular in the 70s, I, I thought I had been taken by like somebody else. I mean, I, I hadn't even seen him. I, I didn't know. So I was, I was super frightened because I thought... 
somebody from an alien planet or something had taken me because this voice was playing in my ear, this eerie sounding voice, and I couldn't move hardly, and I knew I'd been taken. So of course I was just terrified. I I I was absolutely you know immobilized and. And at age 12, I weighed about 60 pounds. I was a tiny little girl. I was years from puberty. I mm-hmm. was still very, very small in in stature. And in my my mind, I thought that I had been taken by somebody. Um, didn't know exactly what. I just knew this funny-sounding voice on this little intercom was incredibly terrifying. And the intercom, it turns out, was actually him uh telling you essentially that you had been abducted by aliens um did he was this a recording or was he talking in the documentary i could never make you know figure this out was this a recording that was playing through that box or was he up front driving talking into something uh as this alien well, from everything I know, he made recordings um, because they were manipulated into this high-pitched sound. Okay. That they, but they, the FBI, I mean, this is years later. I, I believe that these people were real for, for four years of my childhood. And again, I'm not sure how much of the story we want to give away here. But anyway, I um, know that he manipulated the recordings. But um, they played constantly. I mean, they would play for, you know, an hour. And then I would go in and out of a deep sleep because the allergy pill was actually had been replaced with a sleeping pill. Mm-hmm. But that was my allergy pill that I was given. But after that, then there were, there were lots of other, um, you know, relaxing pills is what they called them that I was supposed to take. And I would go in and out of a fairly deep sleep Mm -hmm. where it was in and out of that conscious state. I remember when I was a kid and I can sort of relate to, to, to what she's talking about going in and out of sleep. I must've been probably about 12, 13 years old thereabouts. And, uh, I fell asleep one night and now I've since realized what happened, but but uh, if if anyone has ever had sleep paralysis before, it's like you're kind of awake, but you're really sleeping, and and you have like this weird feeling that someone is is in the room with you or whatever. And so I was probably twelve or thirteen, and I I, I go I, I and I I think I'm awake, and I see like this light come through the room, and I can't move, and I see like this shadowy thing, and I'm like I can't move, and I'm I'm screaming, but nothing is coming out, and. Eventually, I, I like wake up. I can move now, and I I go downstairs and I tell my mom, I'm like, Mom, something something really weird just happened, and she's like, What? You know? And I'm like, I think I was abducted by aliens, and my mom's looking at me like, What are you freaking crazy? crazy? <laughs> but right? um, so you know, when you're a kid like that, hey, you 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 know, I I think you were 12 years old. Um, you you you're easily susceptible to 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 things like that to to ideas yeah. being put into your head. And and this guy obviously had a whole plan. So he puts this right. idea in your head and he essentially says, you've been abducted by aliens. Uh, the world is going to end unless you have uh, sex uh, with uh, this man and have a child uh, that will save the world. Uh, and so uh, the guy comes out and it turns to be, it turns out to be this guy who's this great family friend, this father figure of yours. Um, are you, when, when, when they tell you that you have to do this, are you disgusted by this? Are you confused? Are you scared? I, I mean, what, what what goes through your head when this story is told De- to you? Definitely when I'm confused and I'm scared because I don't know a lot about sex. I'm, I'm pretty innocent. I grew up in a small town and it wasn't, um, it certainly wasn't on my mind yet. Uh, like I said, I didn't hit puberty until I was almost 17. and I just, yeah, I was scared. I didn't, I didn't really know a whole lot about what that would mean, and especially the way it was presented by this, this, these voices on this little intercom. It was that, you know, to have this child to save the dying planet, and that I would have a, a companion would be provided 
for me. And, you know, it, it spoke like that in very kind of odd, almost biblical kind of uh, terminology. And when I was told to go to the front of the motorhome, and this is a couple of days into having been in and out of consciousness, having the straps come off my hands and feet so I could go to the bathroom, but still having a partition that I couldn't see beyond that back bedroom part Mm -hmm. of the motorhome. And so when all that came off and they were, they had said they'd been watching me since I was born and I was this very special person that was going to have this savior, so to speak, to save the dying planet. Um, to go meet the male companion that they were providing for me. Well, there he was, this second father is how I felt about him, Mm -hmm. uh, to me, covered with blood on the, passed out on the couch in the upper part of the motorhome. And I'm just shaking him and waking him up. Like, B, B, you have to wake up. You have to wake up. We've been taken. We've been taken. And and he comes to, and he, you know, this, I mean, he was such a great actor. And he says, oh, Dolly, what happened? I said, we were going out to the stables to go horseback riding. I saw this white light that was coming out of the sky, and the car went out of control. And, oh, my gosh, I must have knocked me out. I'm covered in blood. And are you okay? Are you okay? So that's how I met the male companion who was, to me, like my second father. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand everything that was going to unfold. I just knew that I was supposed to go to the male companion and that now I discover who this is and that now it's... It's, in, uh, in a way, you're relieved, your young mind, you're 12, yeah. you're relieved that, okay, I know this guy, I'm in this yeah. predicament with someone I know as opposed to a yeah. complete stranger. Now, obviously, in hindsight, this guy set the whole thing up. He wants to have sex with this young girl, this elaborate hoax that he's doing uh, mm-hmm. to, to, to sort of uh, keep her compliant and whatnot. Um, so and that scared. that part of the documentary is understandable to people. The the from from callers that I've had that have watched this and recommended this abducted in plain sight on Netflix to me and 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 they go, "You got to watch this rover. It's unbelievable." And I go, oh, "Okay, what's I get it. Kids are abducted. They're sexually abused. I've seen seen stories of this before." The part that is hard for people to understand, or one of the many parts, but your parents did not report you missing. For a number of days, I, I don't remember. I think it's like four days or something like that. Um, right. They don't report you missing, and and many many people. I, I had a guy who emailed me. He goes, because we started talking about this documentary. He goes, I watched it after I heard you talk about it, and as a father, I just want to kill those parents of hers. Mm-hmm. Um. Now that you're an adult, I don't I don't know if you have kids of your own. Um, I do. Yes. Mm-hmm. What do you think was in there? Uh, what well, what can, can you tell, tell you. to people who don't know you <laughs> and your family? I mean, how do you explain yeah. that to people? Well, I can explain it really easily. If somebody has ever been in a situation where they've been conned, even if it was buying something from a salesman at the door and then regretting it later... <laughs> If you can put yourself in the shoes of, and every person right now listening to this show would have to would have to think in their mind of the people they trust most, not least most. My parents, who loved this family as they apparently loved us, would have signed paperwork. If we die, and if my dad was a twin, an identical twin, and we were very close to my twin brother, to my dad's twin brother's family, they, my cousins who lived also in Pocatello, if we die, and if Uncle Dick and Aunt Carolyn, our aunt and uncle, if they couldn't take care of our children, the third people in line that they would have signed paperwork for to take us three girls and care for us in their death would have been Robert Birch told and his wife and family. Right. 
So you have to think of the people that you trust the most, your brother-in-law, your whoever it is, your best of friends. And right now you're not thinking there is no way that these people would hurt my child. There is just no possibility of it. And then when you add that for the, they, they thought maybe they were in a car accident. They called Gail, his wife. They're like, where are they? What, what, do, you, do you have any information? And she's like, well, no, I, I'm sure that they'll, they'll be back, you know, and so a day goes by and another day goes by. They call the, the FBI office. It's closed it's on a weekend. It's closed. And she's, Gail, his wife, is begging them, please don't, please don't call anybody. I'm sure that they're just, they'll be back. And, and you're, you're in a in a little small town. There's no internet. There's no cell phones. We're making copies on a ditto machine, <laughs> and this these are your best friends, <laughs> and they have five children of their own. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, nothing, nothing. There's still no no idea that there could be anything nefarious going on at all. That um, something has happened. The, so now, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So then they they do call, they do finally get through to somebody and call. Um, And of course, the first thing they are thinking is maybe there's been an accident. And they did try calling the police to see if anything had been reported in that way and nothing had been. So I don't, I don't know how to help people because I have the most amazing parents on the planet. They went through the most horrific kind of thing that anybody could ever survive um, with their child seen twice. And I would never have made it mentally um, if I did not have the parents that I had for the first 12 years of my life. They were perfect. They, we had an ideal childhood. We had parents that loved us unconditionally and were always there for us and communicated with us around the dinner table every night we we had a voice they were there was never one ounce of abuse or anything from our parents they so, they're the reason that i'm alive today so then this uh this this birch told guy who who abducted you um he takes you down to mexico you got to see this documentary abducted in plain sight on, on netflix because Again, like I said, I'm going broad strokes. He takes you down to Mexico. I'll just kind of blow through the yeah. story. Takes you down to Mexico, gets married to you in Mexico, uh, because I guess you can get married at the age of 12 in Mexico. God only knows. Um, gets married to you. Uh, he's having sex with you. Uh, you are doing this under the idea that these aliens have have, have are looking to you and him to have a baby to save the uh, to, to save the world. So you're having sex with him. Um, at some point, um, they get a hold of him, or he calls back, or or I I don't, I don't remember exactly the details, but uh, he tells your your parents um, that that you guys got married, and he's asking to come back, like, hey, uh, can we come back and get married? I think is is essentially what what he tells your parents, right? Well, uh, sort of. So basically, what what he the story that he made up was that now that he had, you know, had this mental breakdown and just needed to get away and took me on a trip to Mexico, that in order to come back into the United States, to re-enter the United States, he had to to have me married to him so that he could get back into the United States. Oh, wow. That's great. Because I don't know if they mentioned that in the documentary. Uh... They do, but it's very, it's a, it's through the brother. It's through his brother. I see. He talks about that because um, that, that's what, that was the story. So that was his cover story was, I didn't really want to marry, his cover story was, I didn't really want to marry this 12 year old. No, but in order yeah. to get back, I, I had to like, I had to marry her so I could come across the border and with her yes, wow. to bring her back because now it would be, you know, cause I have no paperwork or, yeah. you know, I mean to get back. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. And so your yeah. parents essentially fall for this uh, in, in, in some regard. Sort of. My mom falls for it more than my dad. My dad, by this point is like, Something is is wrong with this 
this man and I don't want us to have anything really to do with him. Um, I just think we've got to, we've got to distance ourselves from the family, which only made him, you know, fight harder and manipulate harder on all of my family. So but yes. they eventually get back. Um, he, he, he is, uh, he, he he continues to manipulate and whatnot. The the FBI is involved. Eventually, your your uh, parents drop the charges uh, against him. Um, he he, but he continues to to see you. And you're now, I guess, like thirteen at this point or whatever. He tells your parents that, hey, uh, I had this mental breakdown. I don't know what's wrong. You know, he he says as part of his therapy, he has to see you at night and and basically sleep in your bed with you in their home, right? So a psychoanalyst gave him these tapes, and we find out later this wasn't even a real psychoanalyst. And um, it's interesting. I had a woman the other day tell me she had a similar experience in this about same time period with somebody that she was married to. Anyway. Um, that you, he had to listen to these tapes and then he had to lay on the bed and I was asleep. I mean, I have no recollection of this. Mm -hmm. And, and he was supposed to lay on the bed, listen to the tapes and that that would, that would do the reparative therapy that he was under with this psychologist or psychoanalyst. And that was, yeah, that was a part of the therapy of him being able to overcome his mental defect so to to cut a a long story uh as short as possible because i do have some questions for for uh jan broberg who's on with us she's the subject of the netflix documentary abducted in plain sight after this he ends up abducting her again like the same person abducts her twice Dieter. same guy same guy uh abducts her twice he uh they they the fbi eventually gets gets her back um he kind of gets off a pr pretty lenient uh, sentence. Um, I don't know. Maybe things were different back then. Who knows? But he gets off pretty e easily. Um, and uh, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but even if it, after he abducted you the second time, didn't you have, did you have contact with him after that again? Was he still sneak? There was at some point he was yeah. coming into the house. And the question yeah. that wasn't answered in the documentary after they, you know, at this point you're abducted twice. Uh, the parents, FBI, police, everyone knows. Okay, that's now there's there's no question. But he, right. he continues to to somehow get into your uh, house at night and see you. And that was a question that I didn't think was answered in the documentary, which was. How did he get in after after he's abducted you twice? Was he sneaking in through a window? Did your parents allow him in? What what was going on that after the second abduction he was still able to see you in in your house? So after yeah after he the second abduction and he 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 did serve nineteen days in jail and then went to a mental hospital for about six months. The entire time he was in contact with me through through I would get notes from people I kids at school that I didn't know that somehow he must have known their parents or I, I'm not sure how he got them but that's how I would get a note from somebody it would usually came through another student at at my school and it would tell me to go to a certain phone booth I mean this is back in the days where we had phone booths and and I, to ride my bike and I would go there and to sit on the floor of the phone booth and the phone would ring at a certain time of the day so I'm literally getting home from from you know junior high school and my first year of high school and saying mom I'm going on a bike ride and riding my bike to a phone booth sitting on the ground until the phone rings and on the other end of the line is is either him or the high-pitched alien voice I mean it was one or the other oh so he keeps up the alien voice so and, and oh, after yeah. she's been abducted twice she oh, still believes this, uh, this, 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 oh, yeah. this alien abduction. She still believes that, like, the mission hasn't been completed. I have to continue to have sex with this guy. We have to have a baby. We have to save the world. The world's going to end if I if I don't do this. That's and completely I real to Jan. Hit, and I haven't hit puberty still. Yeah. I'm still 14 to 15 years old, and 
thinking that by my 16th birthday, because that there was a deadline that by the time I was 16, I had to have had this child save the planet. And if I hadn't, you know, performed the mission by that point, then they would take my little sister. How did he also? How did he get into that? Because he didn't he come into your oh, bedroom as yes, well? How did he, he did. get into the house? He snuck in. Okay. Yeah, he snuck in. Nobody let him in. <laughs> Nobody let him in after that. After that second time, my that's some knew that's some balls. I mean, because yeah, he if was, your parents caught him in there, they would have killed yeah. him. I yeah. assume. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and his and his wife had divorced him during the second kidnapping while I was missing. She had finalized the divorce, had moved away with her five children. I mean, everybody knew, and I, you know, I now have heard from six other women who were also molested and raped by this man as little girls. So I know of six others, three before me and three after me. Wow. <laughs> so that, it's not it's not just a singular case because that's the real that's the real message that we decided to tell our story, to expose ourselves and my parents, you know, to be so brutally honest about the mistakes they made and what they didn't see. So we we hope somebody else will see it because these kind of perpetrators that live in our homes and our congregations and our communities, they just move on to a different subject. They don't, they don't stop. They just move to somebody new. And that's what I think is a huge message here is that they don't get shut down. Somebody in the family maybe confronts that person, but they don't put them in jail. It just doesn't happen. It is so, it is such a huge problem that um, we have to start talking about it. And nobody wants to because you don't want to see that it's somebody that you know and love. You don't want to see the signs. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, every listener out there knows someone right now who is being sexually abused and they just don't know it yet. And the person that is abusing them is someone that they know, love, and trust. I am telling you, every single person is going to five years from now, 10 years from now, know something that they don't know right now. And it's under their nose. Jan, uh, Jan has her own children now. Did you never let your kids talk to anyone? I would just keep them <laughs> locked in their bedrooms growing up. You know, we I thank goodness I've had a lot of great conversations with my kids. I, I think, uh, you know, they're, they're very open. Um, I'm just really I'm just hopeful. I, I actually want them to trust people and I want them to have wonderful relationships with others. And it, and I certainly, you know, have also been very, very cautious, I guess, in, in sleepovers and who comes into the house and, and that I have to, you know, I, I look at people certainly differently. Um, but I, but I still, am a, I still have, a huge level of trust and and love for people in general and, and specifically in my life. It's just I can see things. And if my gut ever says something is not quite right, somebody's taking too much interest in, you know, my child, it's just not normal. Right. I, I just see things that I, I think others maybe wouldn't see, and that's why I'm telling my story because I want you to see it. It's the guy you're dating who doesn't care about you. He's after, he's after your, your child. Jan, um, the, um, uh, Jan Broberg is on with us. She's the subject of the documentary abducted in plain sight. You can watch it on Netflix abducted twice by the same guy. Uh, parents don't report it the first time for four days. Uh, then afterwards they let this guy sleep in the bed with her a after the fact. Uh, it's a crazy, crazy story. Um, your mother wrote a book about this. This documentary was made. Um, how this must have been or how did your parents react after the book comes out? Your mother writes this book about it. Uh, the documentary comes out. How do your parents react to this? Because I just know what people have called in and told me. I mean, I, there's there's a. There's a guy on or a woman on line two right now who says her parents were the worst parents um, how uh, they really opened themselves up to this, um, with, with, you know, by doing these interviews and whatnot, almost in a way they must've known, like, we're going to, we're going to look bad no matter how, you know, the, the, the person's going to yeah. look at this. There's, they'll, they'll never understand it. 
uh, you know, um, how did they deal with this? Because I'm sure people must have either read this book, seen this documentary or whatever, and gone like, they, it's just hard for people to understand. How have they dealt yeah. with the aftermath? Well, my for one thing, my father passed away in November, so he's he's not here dealing with um, all of that. We're, we're, we're kind of um, my mother, who I have to say is probably one of the strongest people I know. She said, "You know, I see where I was." I, you now, looking back, she says, I see how manipulated and how brainwashed I was. We were all in love with him. All of us loved him. And and he knew that he had to find every person's, you know, weak point and that he would figure out how to get in there and make everybody do something that they would regret or to have them over a barrel, so to speak, mm -hmm. so that when the, the day came, they would they would be embarrassed or not, not talk, or maybe not do what maybe the woman online too would have done. Um, so I, I just, I think that that also they knew and my mother and I have had many conversations in the last couple of weeks. She said, you know, I'm, I'm, I totally owned the part that I played and how I didn't see, I had no idea that, that he was harming my child because she never would have, I mean, it would have been different, but she didn't know right. because she was also in her own, you know, it's like somebody obfuscating over here and then causing a smoke screen over here so that you don't see the reality of what's really going on. Because she, she even, she, she, part. he was holding it over her head. She had an mm -hmm. affair with this right. guy. Mm -hmm. uh, same guy yeah. that kidnapped same her. Same guy that mm -hmm. kidnapped the daughter. And then this, uh, yeah. Jan, I'm going to tell you the reaction that I had. I don't know how, I, I, Dieter, I think he probably had the same reaction. There's one point in this documentary where I'm watching it and my wife is with me and I go, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. Right. Um, yeah. And that has to do with your father. Um, yeah, my jaw hit the floor <laughs> at that scene. Yeah. Um, yeah. When did you learn about that aspect of the story and maybe i won't even watch the documentary oh, i don't want to i don't want to blow it for people well, but when did you learn i mean that's a tough tough thing for a father a man oh, to admit Dad never never forgave himself but, you know my dad grew up with an identical twin brother they had two cousins that were their same age they that lived on a farm i mean they'd all been in the barn together many times <laughs> Do you, when did you learn about this, that that, that um, happened? You know, that was later in my adult life because yeah. I wasn't talking about everything, certainly not in detail until I was in my mid-20s. I mean, I told every, you know, when I realized that the that the story, you know, the, it wasn't real. I the mean, aliens weren't know. right, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, but, but to really talk about all the icky stuff, because it wasn't like, I mean, I had a tiny little body. It was, it was, a, it was a horrible, it was not like sex with a developed, you know, 14-year-old. Did whatever. you have any, um, uh, they, they uh, uh, you know, yeah. and you didn't tell anyone that you were sexually assaulted after you uh, came back, abducted the no. first time. Um, no, nor the second time. Did you never, have any, never. Uh, obviously, uh, mental scars, no doubt. Uh, did mm -hmm. you have any lasting physical uh, effects of this, uh, the, the sexual relations that you're having at the age of 12 with, a, with an, uh, an adult male? Um, did you have uh, complications later in life or, or, or anything? Well, I, I, you know, and I don't know that this is directly related to that, but I did have a really, really hard time with, you know, overcoming the mental blocks around sex and around, you know, a normal relationship. But I, but I feel like the therapy that I've gone through and I've had some wonderful counselors and, and I've, I've been married more than once and I had, you know, really some very understanding um, partners, my, my son's father in particular, who, I don't think I'd have made it through my first marriage um, had he not been really uh, an understanding and kind and gentle person. Um, but but I got to a point where I think I'm I'm pretty healthy and normal in those ways in in my 
you know, my sex life and my physical understanding of me as a woman and my body, and I'm pretty happy and healthy. But I, I do think that the scars that remain are those emotional scars that, um, that I feel, and it's interesting because it, it doesn't so much center around the sexual aspects of my life as it does around trying to always fix everything and save people and and basically you know I, I have a hard time um finding the boundary between taking care of myself and taking care of you know everybody and everything else and I think that that's an interesting thing a, a lot of women would relate to is is um because the numbers are that 50 percent of all the women out there that are listening for sure have been through some sort of sexual assault as as young people before the age of 18, it's about 50%. So it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. And the numbers are like two out of um, 10 boys, you know. And so we're talking an epidemic proportion of people who have actually been through some sort of this abuse and they haven't told or they tell later in life or they never tell. And that that person the abuser just goes on to the next victim and the next and the next. And we get the big, the big cases on TV that, you know, come to the forefront of the news, but it's the suffering. It's the silent. It's the silence. That's what sexual abuse does. It is a scream of silence. You don't talk about it. You don't tell. You think it's your fault. You feel shame. So first and foremost, I would not have survived without parents who had talked to me and communicated with me openly in my life for the first 12 years of my life and who continued to do that even when I wasn't talking to them. They continued to always be there and love me and no judgment and 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 I still wasn't talking because it was it was such a well manipulated, you know, brainwashing scheme and plan. This guy but, um, um, this guy who kidnapped you twice um Mm-hmm. He he died, I think, in two thousand five. You so the story comes out. Yeah. You he he goes, no, no, no. They're making this whole thing up, essentially. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I didn't I didn't do all this bad stuff. But uh, yeah, he he died. Um, was that he was, yeah? Was ahead. was that a weight off of your shoulders in a in a way yeah. that he died? Because I could imagine that even as an adult woman. You must have had some sort of fear that this guy oh, may do something to you. Definitely. And I think that's also another aspect that I I don't think people fully comprehend from the documentary. And you have to remember, we're talking about a six-year, six, almost seven-year period of time in our life reduced down to 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, most people have something in their life that they've done that they wouldn't want to broadcast or advertise to the world, that it was done in secret, and they, you know, they feel bad about it. I do all sorts of stuff every day. I was doing stuff last night I don't want people to know about. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. So you're taking taking a family's life, a six, seven-year period of time, reducing it down to a 90-minute documentary. I mean, we have 60 more hours of footage that didn't make it into the documentary. How did they, how did they, uh, uh, if, if, two questions that I'll throw into one. How did the documentary come about? Were you behind it? Did someone approach you? And uh, also, was there anything in this documentary, Abducted in Plain Sight, which you can watch on uh, Netflix, Jan Broberg, the subject of that is, is on with us. Was there anything in that documentary that after now it's out, everyone's seen it. I mean, this has been trending all over. Uh, um, is there anything that didn't come across the way that you wanted it to or or that people may misconstrue or that just something that you go, I wish that would have been in there? Or uh, is there anything that, that out of the documentary that, that you just think that you don't like or that you didn't come across or that was unclear or, or you know, that, that could help people's understanding? Anything left out? Yeah. Uh, first of all, to answer question number one, yes, I, I was approached. Uh, someone that had found my mother's book, our producer, uh, the producer, Stephanie Toby, she had found the book and had read it in one day, our self-published book, 
not the new book that's coming out, Abducted in Plain Sight, but the old book. Um, and she she figured out a way to find me, and and that was the beginning of that of the documentary being made. Um, she she was able to find Sky Borgman, became the director, cinematographer, producer as well. And the two of them, along with Emily Kincaid, who came on shortly thereafter, just championed the story, both of them having uh, sisters and siblings and, and uh, a great empathy for what our family had gone through. So that brings me to the next um, the next question of, was there something? And I think it, it definitely was the hardest for me when I saw the documentary for the first time trying to come to terms with how people would perceive my parents. That, and we've talked a lot about that today because I think my whole um, life, I, I don't know if my father or my mother ever have truly forgiven themselves, and maybe they shouldn't according to the listeners and the people watching the documentary. But, um, but honestly, if, if I could have left if I could have put in the documentary more about how people around the the victim or the child that is being molested, how they are manipulated, how the manipulator, he, I mean, he was, he was loved by all the members of our community. He owned a furniture store. He was loved by all the people in our congregation. When I came back the first time, they were all saying, well, you're not going to, you're not going to press charges. I mean, he didn't hurt her. He never would hurt her. What's his wife going to do and his five kids? You know, they were all on mm-hmm. his side. Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, I don't think people get enough of that in the documentary to understand how how a master manipulator finds your weakest point or they just know how to make you feel special, but not just the child, how to make dad feels special, how to make mom feel special, and then how they're going to manipulate that in a way to be able to cause all of this chaos and smoke screen on all these different, in all these different people, so that they can then cut through to what they want, which is access to your child. What happened with the... I uh... could do a docudrama, a 10-part series, that's what it would be about. What manipulation and brainwashing actually looked like to all of the rest of the people, Mm -hmm. not to me. What... uh, That's what I would do. uh, Jan, this... this, uh, uh, Robert Birchtold, uh, who who took you a couple of times, uh, sexually assaulted you, uh, his wife, you said she divorced him, uh, and I watch uh, I watched this documentary maybe about a week ago, um, and and maybe my memory is faulty. She was not in the documentary. Is that correct? No, but from what I understand, the filmmakers invited her to be a part of it, and she could have a huge voice in helping women who are also staying in relationships and in situations where they know something's wrong or they've been they've been physically harmed themselves to maybe shed some light on what happens? Why do we stay? Because they had moved around several times before they got to my little town of Pocatello, Idaho. I don't know that she knew anything. I'm certain that she didn't know. But when you find out that there were three girls before me that had been sexually assaulted and one girl nine years after my second kidnapping who did tell her mother she was going to kill herself, and the mother, who was a psychiatric nurse herself and best friends with Robert Birch, told she finally told her mother nine years later that he had been raping her since she was nine. She was 18 and ready to take her own life. And I've spoken to this woman on the phone, mm-hmm. and they and he was put in jail for rape of a child in Salt Lake City. Um, nine years after my second kidnapping. Why do so, you think the wife, uh, this Gail, I think was her name, why do you think she didn't want to participate? I just think it mu- it's like so many people. Why don't they want to talk about this? Why don't they out Grandpa and put him in jail? You can't handle it. That this guy, I'm, I was married to this man for X number of years. I had five children. You know, she's married to him for at least, at least, 13, 14 years, because her oldest son and, and my and myself, we were the same age. Do you still see the, uh, do you, have it. you had any contact with 
Uh, you were friends with uh, the Birch All Told Kids. Children. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have... I had a crush on their oldest friend. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so cute. That's the That's second so documentary. Wait till they, wait till they uh, hit it off. And, uh, they, oh, um, gosh. What, uh, have you had any contact with with them, do they have any insight on this, or or have you not talked to well, anyone? There hasn't been there hasn't been the opportunity to have that conversation because I think that there are certainly the majority of his children. We have had some contact with with the second oldest son because um, he's an attorney, and my my younger sister is an attorney, and they they've spoken before, and he said, I mean, and of course. You just have to believe me, I guess. But he did say to my sister on the phone, I am not my father's attorney and I would never represent him. Mm -hmm. That was said to my sister when we were going through a stalking injunction that I was trying to because he showed up 30 years later at a at a speaking engagement. I was speaking to a room of a thousand women and their daughters at a university and he showed up in a van with a gun at the university. Yeah, this birch told guy, yeah. Yeah, he'd seen my picture on a poster and come to find out he was living an hour away from where I was speaking. Had no idea where he was, that he had remarried. Both of his stepdaughters from that second marriage had run away from home. They're two of the the, the girls that I know he molested mm. after wow. me. So, um, and then and he probably he picked to... that woman to get married to, not because he even yeah. liked the woman. He goes, oh, oh, she's sorry. got a couple of daughters. They, 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 yeah. I like the way they look. Yeah, and she was a second grade teacher, and he was playing Santa Claus to all the second graders. In their oh, my school, Lord. And everybody in the community loved him. All I'm telling you is that people think they're super smart and that they would see it and that they would know and that they would do something. And I am telling you, people do not see it and they do not do the right things. They confront the person instead of going to the authorities, keeping a record of the times when they see this person. In their fa- at their family reunion that goes off with the younger cousin or whatever it is, I'm telling you, you keep a, a record and then you start to find a way, whether you find a, a, a somebody in the police department who says you talk to the child in this way and you got to find, they've got to talk, which of course isn't happening either. The child is scared or getting rewards or whatever it is mm-hmm. to keep the child quiet. I, I have two more questions for you, Jan. And we've been out with Jan uh, Broberg a long time. She has other stuff to do. She can't sit and talk with me all morning long. She's the <laughs> subject of awesome. Abducted in Plain Sight, which you can watch on Netflix now. Um, so when you got back, uh, well, both times, really, the first time you were abducted and after the second time you were abducted, um, you didn't tell uh, anyone that you had that you were having sex with this Robert Birchfold guy. You didn't tell anyone. Um, no. And I, I remember Absolutely watching not. the documentary. I would have been vaporized. I thought I would be vaporized. If right. The aliens would vaporize you. Would um, yeah. And I also remember my wife asked me, she goes, what would you have done? And I go, well, I remember when I was a little kid, my mom always told me, look, if someone says that they'll hurt you or they'll hurt me or whatever the case may be, just go ahead and tell me anyways. You know, um, what advice would you give to parents? Um, uh, to to tell their children uh if let's say god forbid something does happen or is about to happen or may happen with 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 a kid in a sexual assault or whatever what do you tell parents uh to 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 tell their children or how can they be, because obviously if you had come back and you go I, I was having sex with them in 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 mexico we wouldn't have this documentary it'd be a, diff- a completely different story so what do you tell the parents that they can warn their children or, or, or condition their children? Or, or I mean, what advice right. do you give? So uh, I think the first thing is that you have a great education with your children set up already. So for me and my two sisters, it was eating dinner together around the dinner table and there were no electronics. There was nothing except uh, TV was not on. It was in a separate room and we talked and and we were listened to. So first of all, establishing that your children can talk to you about anything. I remember we were, my parents wanted to buy a bigger home and move. And this is, we were maybe, I was eight or nine years old at the time. 
and we had this big family discussion around the dinner table, and we didn't want to move. You know, now I look back and think, oh, we probably should have moved, <laughs> but we didn't. We we but we ended up not moving because our opinion mattered. So first of all, we had parents that listened to us. We knew that that we could talk about anything. I think the other part of that is for parents to be more open as soon as they feel their children are ready. Because, you know, this man, you know, I wasn't having what I called sex with him. I was being, being used as a, as a, uh, a piece in a, in a puzzle to save a dying planet. And I just, you know, it was, you know, I, I wasn't developed enough to have had, you know, that kind of relationship with him. It was, it was so important that I could have maybe known more about what that really meant by, by age 12, which I think most parents are talking to their children in more depth about it. I mean, I knew a little bit because we'd had some little class at school and, right. and it wasn't like my parents would never talk about it. It was just, it was the seventies and it was just not, I mean, we were, and again, I was just so pre-puberty. I mean, I didn't hit that. So I was 17, so this is all way over. And so I was tiny, tiny. And to just maybe have had more information so that I would have, I, I just went back and I'm like, well, what would have worked with me? I don't know if anything would have worked because I really thought it was being watched 24-7 and that I had to do what I was told. Or my dad would be killed and my sister would be taken and my other sister would go blind and I mean, there were so many threats that I, you know, plus this high level of you have to save the dying planet, you know, then I have, then I'm also this real purposeful person that has a, a great purpose to serve on the planet. So I think, I think it's the open in that communication, looking for signs, making sure that your children constantly know that no matter what somebody says, they, you know, any part of you that's covered by a swimming suit if they're tiny kids you know how you talk to little kids matters too because you don't want to traumatize them you know that that's they're in charge of that nobody gets to to you know touch that those parts of them and that they're never in trouble that it's all that that if they say like you your friends that or your wife and you talked about you know you just don't you just don't ever make the child you don't use shame or or guilt if i uh, punishment if it were halloween and i show up i'm trick-or-treating and i na i knock on jam broberg's door mm -hmm. and i'm wearing an alien costume you open the door does that freak you out to this day <laughs> a little bit <laughs> <laughs> she can't even probably watch outer space movies or anything um well, jan uh the, I, I, she has a new book by the way it, it's coming out march 1st yeah. it's the same title as the uh, as the documentary, okay. Abducted in Plain yeah. Sight. Uh, right. And, of course, you can watch the documentary on Netflix. We left out some, we left out some juicy details from this, oh, uh, yeah. from this documentary, and you gotta, you got to yeah. watch this. And a, a couple of us, are, you know, the guys on it, were like, what? You can't. What? No, you not. I'd never. Ah. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, the fire. And, I mean, the guy was a criminal. I mean, he was a sociopath. He was a master manipulator. And I, I just hope that at some point we do a 10-part series so that it really focuses on the brainwashing. That's the part that I think, you know, you just are getting these big chunks throughout that seven years that are, you know, they're, they're, they're shocking. But they all are couched within being manipulated by someone else. It is a uh, an incredible story, and what, what do you? This is my last question because I do have to go. What what uh, what do you? I know you're uh, you're an actress. Um, I, I know you've done some acting. What do you? How do you spend your days now, Jan? Are, are is that how you make a living? Do you have a another job? What do you? Uh, I do. I, I that's definitely my my passion has been since I was six years old, and uh, I've, I've been an actress ever since, stage and screen, and. I run a theater now. I uh, have a beautiful, intimate indoor theater that is just a professional space where we do plays and musicals and concerts. And I bring people from New York and Chicago and and all over the country to perform there or to be in our our uh, plays and shows. And it's just an extraordinary little gem in southern Utah, in Ivins, Utah. It's called Kayenta. 
the Center for the Arts at Kayenta. I'm the executive director there, and I still act. I just had an audition for a, a film that's being done up in the Salt Lake area, and I also have a an agent and a manager in California, and have worked there for many many years as well. So, it's a uh, it's an incredible in fact, story. This this is interesting. I did a part on uh, a guest star on Criminal Minds, mm -hmm. and I played the mother of a child who had been kidnapped. That was full circle. Did they know when they cast you years. in that position? No, that, no they no. didn't. Wow. They had no idea. Wow. It so was called The Return. Criminal Minds, The Return. Yeah, he'd been missing for three years. It's so interesting. And was so brainwashed, he wouldn't talk to me. Wow. In the film. That's the uh, episode. That's that is that is crazy, Jan. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a fascinating story. You can see the, the documentary "Abducted in Plain Sight" on Netflix right now, and the book comes out March first. Jan Broberg, thank you so much for coming on with us this morning. Thank you. Hope it helps somebody. Thank Thanks you, so Jan. Uh, Jan Broberg, wow.